Greetings all. Last Outrider here with the next part of Who Are the Gene Stealers? And this is an interesting part because it talks about how do the gene stealers see the Tyranid species as a whole? Well, in fact, I got a question asking, can Tyranids, uh, I mean, gene stealers survive independently of the hive mind? And the answer is they already are. Um, in fact, we'll just read the story and you'll understand. The hive fleet descends. As a cult pushes its tendrils ever further into its host civilization, it prepares for the day of its great ascension. Though it may be decades, even centuries in coming, sooner or later, a psychic shadow will fall across the star system in which the cult has spread. This is the shadow in the warp, the first sign of the utter despair to come. At first, the strange penumbra of this influence sends soothsayers mad and inspires wild panic in those who channel the energies of the dwarf. The Astronomicron, at first, becomes dim, then finally shrouded completely as the psychic miasma crawls across the stars, cutting the system off from the rest of the Imperium so that it becomes all but impossible to send reinforcements. Only then does the source of the threat emerge from the darkness. Starlight glints from a flotilla of celestial bodies, visible as a shoal of dots in the night sky. While these bodies may appear beautiful at first, their surpassing ugliness becomes more evident as they draw close. This is a biofleet of the Tyranid race, and it has come not to enlighten, but to devour. The cults see the arrival of this impossible menace as the long-awaited fulfillment of their prophecies. They believe the Patriarch's kin, unfettered by humanity's failings, are here to elevate the faithful and lift them into the light forever. The skies cloud over, thickening with Xenos spores as the Hive Fleet prepares the cult's world for consumption. Enraptured, the cult's true believers tell each other that it is always darkest before the dawn. Celebrations and warlike shouts ring through the streets as their devotional friendly frenzy reaches new heights. Finally, when the Tyrannocytes rain from the sky like fleshy meteors, the cultists wave their banners high, hoping to attract the attention of the angelic host as it descends. The giant brood sacks of the bioships split open to disgorge shrieking, blade-limbed war beasts. A seed of doubt begins to worm its way into the minds of the cultists. Still, their belief in the notion of star-born saviors is so ingrained, they keep fighting against the wider populace. The Tyranid invaders mass together into a tide of chitin and fang, surging over the lands to cut down or consume the indigenous populations. With the hive mind guiding each brood, the Tyranid hordes do not see the gene stealer cultists as prey. In fact, they are ignored altogether at first by the synapse creatures coordinating the attack. For a short and blissful period, cultist and Tyranid fight on the same side. Once their adversaries have been slain, 
The cultists become eager to embrace their distant relatives in celebration, jubilant that their star-spanning family is at last complete. They walk forward, arms wide, into the seething avalanche of weapon forms. Until finally, they realize that they too will be torn limb from limb. Only then does the true magnitude of the cult's folly and foolishness hit home. The mood of the cult swiftly changes from dogged loyalty to panic. The final revelation comes both from within the cult and without. Those the cultists once adored turn upon them in the worst of all possible betrayals. Any who seek succor from the Primarch, Patriarch, sorry, instead go to their doom. With its sentience subsumed by the greater hive mind, the creature becomes just another tyrannid, another nameless cell in the void-crossing superorganism that wants nothing less than to devour the galaxy. As soon as the planet's defenders are overcome, the Patriarch and its brood will attack their own wicked claws punching into their close advisors and trusted minions who die choking on their own disbelief. Those pure strain gene stealers spawned upon the host planet attack their devoted parents without hesitation, slaughtering them in a fury of talons and snapping mouths. Those of the cult who somehow survive this grim twist of fate flee as best they can, but they do not get far. The hail of tyranid spores intensifies, and the planet itself is altered on a molecular level, becoming a noxious hell. Alongside the bodies of the wider populace, the corpses of the cultists are devoured and regurgitated into the acidic digestion pools that bubble upon its surface. There, they are dissolved into a sickening gruel, raw biomass that is sucked up by the ribbed capillary towers into the bioships above. So it is that the host population and the cult's parasitic reflection made whole at last, their bodies mingling in the final act of this apocalyptic tragedy. So that answers your question. Are the gene sealers a separate individual mind, separate from the tri hive mind? Yes, they are. Until the Tyranids arrive, as you can see. Then suddenly the Patriarch just becomes another Tyranid, and all the pure strains, whatever, and they're like, well, that's the way it goes. So here's a little, well, I, there's nothing really else to say. That is the relationship between gene stealers and tyranids. <laughs> uh, oh, here's a little, a little side story then, uh, a narrative. Praise be, cried Sabathrin, raising his shaking arms to locum's heavens. The star children are here to deliver us. He could hardly believe it. In his heart, he had always known that the grandfather's truth would borne away the tissue of lies that suffocated the hated Imperium. Still, to lay eyes upon the star children themselves was something else. The neophytes had long talked of what they would look like, these creatures wholly free from human weakness. None of them had expected there would be quite so many of them. 
Crashing, stomping, sprinting across the lands came a purple and white swarm. It made those of Locum's harvest storm locusts look like thin by comparison. Sabathrin saw monsters in there, towering above even the aegis guns of the Imperial Guard. The Patriarch was darting amongst them, dwarfed by a vomiting horror that spewed its guts into the artillery redoubt. His brood followed close behind. <laughs> Anyways, you get the picture. While they are a mini hive mind of themselves, they are not a part of the big hive mind. Ever. Um, well, that's that. And next time we're going to talk about what exactly is a patriarch. Until then, bye.